your athletic body is only last so long. So if you, you don't catch it when it's right, you could lose that chance that a lot of people lose. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 376. And today, I'm joined by Sensei Victor DeSimone. My name is Jeremy Lesnack. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. We make sparring gear and uniforms and fun apparel and a bunch of stuff, all because I love martial arts and I know I'm not the only one. So if you want to help us out, if you want to thank us in a small way for all the work we're doing with this podcast, you can check out what we make at whistlekick.com. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Or if it's easier, better for you, share this. Follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick all over the place. Or just help us find another guest. You know, there's so many ways you can help us out and just really appreciate that support. If you want to find the show notes with transcripts or other episodes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go. Now, today's guest, Sensei Di Simone, this was a great episode. This was an episode that I expected to go in one direction and it didn't. And I think you'll hear what I'm talking about as we start to get into it. Most of our guests are pretty open. Some of them are really open, but few are as open as today's guest. I got the sense that I could have asked him anything. And in fact, in our pre-show chat, he told me, ask me anything. I'm an open book. And I asked him questions and he didn't hesitate. And that, as far as I'm concerned, always leads to a great conversation. And that's exactly what we had, a great conversation. So I just want to welcome him to the show and I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Sensei Di Simone, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Great. So here, here we have another martial artist who isn't that far from me. You know, we, we seem to be in this hotbed in the Northeast. There's, there are a lot of us doing martial arts, and I, I don't know why. <laughs> it's the cold weather. Maybe that's it. Maybe, you know, in, instead, of, instead of getting frustrated and punching the walls or, or throwing things around, we, we go out, we train, and we punch our friends. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always start on martial arts radio in a, in a pretty straightforward way, but I think it's an important way because it gives us context for everything else we're going to talk about. How did you find martial arts? Um, it starts years ago. Uh, my uncle taught it in the military. He was in, uh, in Italy, stationed in Germany. And then I used to visit Italy every summer as a child. So I was on, it was kind of different in Italy the way they did it. When I went there, it was done in a soccer field. And he taught judo to the military camps and um the local people and it was stationed up with like a kind of a ymca but outdoors so he used to bring me there when i visited in the summer and i was about four that i can remember but i think i went before that but i was four. yeah it was four when i started but um he brought me to the uh the training camps he used to do in the summer and i started there and then i really officially started um, when I came back here to the States from my vacation in late 77, 78 with him. So it started because he taught it in the military and I started going with him during the day when my parents are out doing visiting. So I was bored and I would go with him and that's how it mm -hmm. started. And what was it he was teaching? Uh, judo. Okay. All right. That's, you know, when, when I tend to think of what's being taught to the military, mm -hmm. you know, judo, as practical as it is, as, as wonderful a martial art as it is, I have to admit, it's not the first thing that comes to mind. We've had a number of folks on who have taught or are teaching to the military, some, some sort of combatives, whether it's, you know, Krav Maga or, or you know, Filipino martial arts for, for knife work or something like that. But judo seems to make a lot of sense, especially if you're in that real close quarters you know, kind of jammed up with people. I can, I can see a lot of value there for sure. Yeah. You know, you, some, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah, you know, the premise of it is basically take them off their feet and finish them. So no time to waste close yeah. quarters, like you said. Yeah. So here you are, you're pretty young, you're learning judo. Mm -hmm. And where, where does the martial arts take you from there? Or is, is judo still your primary art or did you branch out into other things uh i branched out in other things mainly i always stayed with judo um through my teen years i boxed from teenage years because i was growing up in the 80s obviously um 
So I boxed from mid eighties to nineties and I took a break from judo, but I came back in like the mid nineties, but I wrestled. I, um, I also did, um, sambo and grappling arts, like obviously Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was connected to it. But, um, I did some Muay Thai also in high school and I taught at a mixed martial arts club and I still do, but mainly it's a jujitsu club now. So it's all grappling arts. But yeah, I, I, I branched out and, but I always stayed with judo. The only break I took was in my teen years to my probably about 20 or so. So the common thread in, in the styles that you've mentioned are for the most part that, that grappling aspect, that very close, you know, beyond hand to hand sort of philosophy. So I'm, I'm curious because grapplers seem to have a different way of looking at combat than kickers, than punchers, than, you know, someone who is accustomed to using a, a knife or a firearm, right? There are different ranges in there. So yeah, you, what was it about grappling that really clicked for you? Um, I, well, I had no choice due to my uncle, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, um, I, uh, the funny story is I always wanted to strike because, you know, as kids, you want to hit things. And my uncle kept uh, reciting to me, when you get into a real fight, the ranges change and the distancing change because he was in combat and he knows pretty much, you know, life and death situation type thing, as, as did my grandparents because they both served in each world war. But um, they always focused on the realness of combat. So when it came to striking, everybody always grabbed not to get hit. So my uncle always instilled in me, you know, punches are great, kicks are great, but if you can throw somebody and choke them, they're not going to fight you anymore or pin them and control them. You don't have to hurt them to stop them from hurting you. So that's, like, like you said, the distances change when real um, – close quarters comes in people we've all been in a uh, situation i'm sure where you've been in an altercation where the first thing they want to do is grab you because nobody really wants to get hit i don't think would you agree i i would yeah i would i've been punched in the face it hurts yeah no i <laughs> I, I did i boxed for quite a while like i said i've done some other stuff and getting hit like you said you, you get used to it i don't think you at one point, I think I did enjoy it in my 20s, but um, as things change, uh, the damage you want to take is minimal. So if you can avoid getting hit, uh, that's why I chose a grappling base to stick with, and it's a little more controlled, and I like the live action of it where you're actually using it. Mm -hmm. You know, now, I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, like I said, I've done some karate, and I've done... Muay Thai, and you do a lot of bag kicking, but you take a lot more damage getting hit. So I, I did a lot of sparring for boxing, and um, I took a lot of damage, you know? Mm. So I, I think it's a little safer if you want to have your children or your loved ones practice grappling, and they're actually using it constantly, because you're either doing Rondori, or if you're doing a wrestling class, you're using that wrestling, and it, the, the reaction is real where some strikers I noticed, and not all of them, some strikers, as they get older or as they start, are premised more on hitting a bag. And then when somebody hits them back, some people freeze up. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it's all person dependent and your philosophy or your action reaction. But I believe when it comes to grappling, that action reaction is always crisp and there. So that's why I prefer it over getting struck in the face or in the body, <laughs> you know? It makes sense. Absolutely yeah. makes sense. And I think there's something to be said for, for grappling in that you can go at, at a, a bit of a higher intensity. You can go harder with less risk of injury. You know, you and I can only punch each other in the face so hard before, you know, we're, we're going to work the next day bruised up and bloody. But we can, we can grapple a bit harder than that, I think. Would you agree? I, I do agree. And, um, you know, you do take elbows and knees grappling. We've all done it. We've all taken hits. People get emotional or, you know, you know, paying attention. But it's a lot more, you know, you're not actually striking with the end of your fist, your palm, your elbow. So 
we've all seen bare knuckle stuff. When it comes to boxing and bare knuckle, bare knuckles uh, do a lot more damage. And, sure you know, you have a padded glove and you still take damage. So, yeah, it's, uh, I agree with you where you can go really hard. Your body gets really conditioned, you know, because you're taking, you know, you, it's body to body contact and you're rolling around and you're getting slammed on the floor and then you're trying to defend the choke. So it's, it's a situation where we're using technique al along with strength and your body has to adapt to that situation. So your lactic acid's going, you got to fight off um, exhaustion. You have to fight your own mind because you're always fighting yourself. That's the first fight. So you got to stay calm inside. And that's what I like about it. You're, you can slow things down and then uh, take a controlled aspect when you're grappling. And you can do that in, in striking, but it takes a little, I believe it took me a lot longer to slow things down when I was doing boxing and some Muay Thai to get used to that action reaction of getting hit and be able, being able to see things before they come. Mm. So I, I think you, you have a lot more control and a lot more time to develop that control and gra grappling with a safer aspect of not taking damage. So, yeah. Yeah, I could, I could see that. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, when, and when we're talking about these arts that you've practiced and, and when we add in Muay Thai and you, you mention some mixed martial arts in there, it makes me wonder what was competition, something you, you ended up doing or you were on, on track for? Yeah. I, um, I competed in judo quite a bit. Um, I did, <laughs> I have a funny boxing story. I, I boxed a bunch of amateur fights and I didn't realize all it took to become pro was uh, all you had to do was pay after I think it was 10 fights. So I boxed and I boxed for a year before any trainers came up to me and said anything. The day I was ready to leave, no one trained me. I went in, I hit the bag. I, um, I did all my own drills that I found in a book. And the day I was ready to leave, they asked me to step into the ring and spar with a few people. And that was about a little over a year. And um, then they started training. But, um, yeah, it's um, – was. Do you think that was coincidence? I don't know. This was, Like I said, they're going back to I, – I won't mention the club's name, even though it's well-respected. And it's a great club, and I believe it is uh, still today. It was at a YMCA locally. And, again, you're going back to – I think it was 87, 88 it was when I joined or 86. I started loosely, but uh, I remember it was an 88 or yeah, 89. I was ready to walk out and one of the trainers come over and said, Hey, what's your name? And I told him my name. He goes, you mind taking a few rounds with this guy? We're trying to get him ready for a fight. And nobody even had taught me how to hit the speed bag. And I learned on my own. And I guess back then the philosophy was different. And I, I was raised in a way, my father, we were immigrants, you know? So I, me, my father was very one-worded. He changed when he got older, but I never, I was always taught work hard. And when the time comes, they'll tell you when you're ready. So I never went up to any of the trainers and asked them how to do anything. I watched, I learned. And I guess after that time, uh, the timing was right. I have no idea what this gentleman's mentality was. But he just knew I was ready to leave, and he picked me at the right time, and I stayed a few extra years because of him. But um, mm. again, I, like I said, no one even talked to me. None of, none of the people that trained there. I just went in and basically did my own work, up, which I found odd. But you know, where did where did you find that that discipline to train on your own? That's not something that most people can handle. <laughs> That's that. Uh, like I said, as a kid growing up, I worked with my dad. We had a repair shop right outside of Boston. And I was going to work. I remember the, I don't know if you remember the blizzard we had here in like 1978. Um, what's that? Did you? I don't. I don't. I was born in 79. Yeah. So we had a big <laughs> blizzard here in 78. I was very young, like around six years old or so. And I remember we couldn't see the front door. So my father took, we had like a month off of school. It was a very bad blizzard. And um, 
he took me to work with him that day. And I was, as a kid, I'm changing snow tires. We had dogs to take care of because no alarm. We had, so I had to walk the dogs in the snow. Um, he had a military Jeep that we made it through everywhere. And you couldn't even see the gas pumps. And um, from that day on, my father and my mother, for that fact, always said, um, work hard, you're going to get results. So my father would always say, don't ask questions, watch and learn. So I would go to the shop every day after school, um, on the weekends, clean up, stuff like that. And uh, he just instilled work ethic in us. So ever since that day, I always never spoke and always listened. So my dad is really responsible for my, uh, I don't know, my philosophy on how to learn and how to excel in something. So that's where I got that from. And what did your father have to say about your, your martial arts and, you know, these different systems that you were training in? <laughs> Again, funny. It's, you ask. Um, a lot of my friends can relate to this. Like I said, we were kids coming from Italy um, in a new area. And like I said, we were raised in the North End area, which was primarily Italian in Boston. So back in the day, it was everybody spoke Italian. And English was a second language. But we, when we came here, um, my dad just said, if you want to learn judo, you go with your uncle. You want to learn how to fix something, we come to the shop. So we just instilled these systems of, all right, I'm going to. He grew up in an era where his father and his mother were. Um, it was very rough. Like I said, it was, he didn't have much of uh, communication with them. And my communication was a little better with him. But again, it was one of those things where he just wanted to make sure we were doing the right thing. He really didn't have much to say till I was in my twenties and I got an injury, but um, he always, he never really asked. He always said, how are you doing with it? And I'm glad you're doing it. But it, it was very, um, it was more of body language type thing with my dad where we never showed uh, fear or pain to him because that's the type of man he was. He never, you never knew he was hurt. You never knew he was good. He was just like a stone, you know? So it's one of those things where I just did it because I thought it was the right thing and uh, the right path to take. I didn't like violence as a kid, you know? So it was one of those things where I could train and have an outlet. And if I wanted to get that anger out as a child or as a teen or as an early adult, I trained. So that's pretty much the path it took with my dad, you know? Yeah. Now, when you, when you say there you didn't like violence as a kid, that's not something that I think most people are going, are going to say. That, that, that Those words make me wonder – was violence something that you were exposed to? Maybe maybe a little more than we might think an average child would be. Yeah, you know, it, it, um, not in my family directly, but again, growing up in the North End, it was kind of a, a rough area where you saw a lot of things. I used to go there every weekend with my family. We went to church. It was a church called St. Leonard's, which I hated as a child. I had to sit through masses. But it was a, it was, you know, you're going back to the seventies in the North End, which was, you know, there was uh, organized crime, let's say back in that day. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of gangster type people in that area that lived in that area. And my uncle had a tailor shop with my other uncle who taught the martial arts. And we used to walk down the street called Salem Street. And... I used to see a lot of things as a child I shouldn't have. And my uncle was a well-respected man. And he used to diffuse a lot of problems. So I saw a lot of things. And one comes to mind with my, one of my cousins who now resides in England because he's not allowed to stay in the U.S. anymore. But uh, I, I remember one, one event that I knew I didn't like violence, you know. And um, that event was, if you want to hear it, I'll explain it. Please. Um, I, I think I was probably, again, this is late seventies. So I was probably like seven. I remember my uncle and I just had finished training. It was a Saturday class 
and it was coming dusk, so it was probably like five or six. It was the summertime, and we're walking through town. So my aunt Maria yelled down from, you know, because he she lived in a building above. He, she yelled down from where she was, and said uh, said something about my my cousin. He's in trouble. He's in jail. Da da da. All this other stuff. So um, my uncle grabs me and said, and on the walk to the police station, and he said to me, he goes, whatever you see here, you don't say anything. I said, okay, no problem. You know, I'm just looking at him, staying quiet as a kid. So uh, we go into the police station, and, uh, you know, he knows all the police officers. We get my cousin out, and it's very quiet on the walk back. And we go to his tailor shop, and he brings him downstairs into the basement. And he gave my cousin the beating that I've never seen in my life. And um, something happened where his buddies tried to, knew he was in there, and they ended up breaking the door and coming downstairs. And my uncle um, had an altercation with like three or four guys. Mm. And I'm sitting there as a kid watching this, and my uncle ended up taking them all out. And I just remember just freezing in the situation. And I remember him telling me, drag the guy over here in the corner and because <laughs> he was laying there you know he's trying to put all these guys in the corner because he you know it was a very close quarters area it's probably you know i couldn't even tell you how big it was but it was the size of a little bigger than your average bedroom where we were when the guys broke the door and it was just a mess and it um i i froze and i didn't know what to do as a child and i just saw the realness of how things could excel and um we ended up leaving and he called there. He knew their dads and stuff. And they, uh, let's say, collected the bodies later. So um, they were pretty beat up. And I saw a lot of things that I shouldn't have seen as a child. Mm. You know, dislocated arms, um, you know, choked unconscious, uh, hit with things. So that day forward, I always said I never want to be in a situation like that. So that stuck in my mind. So that, that's the, uh, a reason why I didn't like um, violence, you know? It was like, I, it was uncontrolled, it was unexpected, it was crazy. But um, again, my uncle always wanted to instill the right values in people. He wasn't a bad man, but he was always a big thing on protect, self-protection and trying to make people do the right thing, especially when my cousin was very troubled. As a, he was probably 19 or 20, maybe 21 at the time. So, and he was always in trouble and he was just trying to keep him on the right track. Hmm. So that's, that's probably the reason why I don't like um, real violence like that. You know, yeah. so again. That's, that's heavy. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a pretty intense experience for anyone of any age, let alone someone that age. And, and certainly... I would think even a bit more impactful being that it's family. It's people yeah. that you love that I assume at least in some way trust. Yeah. And yeah. that's gotta be a bit of a contradiction. Yeah, exactly. I, w I was very confused. Um, Cause this is my cousin and my uncle who I've seen at parties and laugh together. And so this was like the first time I've seen something of that nature. So, yeah, it was very confusing. I understood what was going on to a, a level of what the violence was and what transpired. But as far as the outcomes of what happened, I wasn't ready for it, hmm. you know. So, but it, it matured me and it made me understand that the last course of action should be violence in anything you do. Hmm. Now, quite often when someone experiences that degree of violence at a young age, they tend to go to one extreme or the other. Violence either becomes a part of their life or mm -hmm. they avoid it so greatly that, that sometimes there can be a detriment there. But I'm not getting the sense that either one of the, either end of that spectrum is you. It, it sounds like maybe through martial arts or other means, you, you rejected violence, as you kind of said before, but maybe had a, a healthier understanding of it. Yeah, but you know, my, the talk my uncle had to me after, I was probably about a week later, pulled me aside and he said, 
one thing, you know, I know what you've seen, you shouldn't have seen, he explained everything in depth. And, but one thing I took from it, he says, when it comes to a situation like that, it's fight or flight, you're in or you're out. He goes, you either run or you engage. And that's what I took away from it. So he, he made me understand that you don't have to use violence to solve a matter. He, he always said, try to talk things out, but there's going to come a point where that's not going to work. So you either engage or you disengage. And that's what I understood that at a young age because I can, you know, he made me do in, in club tournaments that were pretty, um, a lot rougher than they were today because you, I, I fought a lot of older men as a young, young child. Like I was in my teens fighting guys in their thirties. And, um, so I understood that when you engage, you have to commit. If you don't have to, then, you know, you're either in or you're out, meaning you're either in contact or you're not in contact. So I, I didn't have a good handle on that, surprisingly so, at a young age. And it didn't fear, it wasn't a fear, it was more of a caution, you know? So, it, yeah, yeah. It, it was controlled, you know? Makes sense. Yeah. Now, you talked a bit about anger and using martial arts as an outlet mm -hmm. for your anger. And, and you, you talked about various points in your life as a, as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult. Mm -hmm. But you left, you know, that was, that was where, where the list ended. So I'm wondering, is anger something that you've come to get a better handle on? Or Yeah, I've had a lot of altercations with my brother. We, we had a shop together. And my, okay. It was a family business. So he, nobody could piss me off more than he could as uh, a teen. And he was six years old. He is, he is six years older than me. So there was a little bit of a bridged gap where he was kind of a, a father figure at one point when my, you know, we did sports and he would help quite a bit. And he was always very good to me. But, um, you know, when, when I'm uh, 13, 14, 15 and I'm boxing, doing judo and all this stuff, I always had a fear of my brother beating me up and I always wanted to beat him up. And, you know, it was one of those things where it became competitive. So, you know, I'd stick my chest out to him when he was in his 20s and I'm in my teens. And the man strength was a little different from a teenager. But I remember, like I said, I, uh, he's the only person that really could make me angry. Anybody else, I could control it. But, but him, uh, growing up, he was the guy, you know. But yeah, it's um, the anger only uh, was was not a a problem. But like I said, between uh, sibling rivalry, yes, it was it was an issue at one point with them, you know. And you're certainly not the first person to to experience that sibling sibling rivalry and experience it in an intense way, sometimes a physical way. Oh yeah, I mean we we certainly see that with. You know, with with, with a, a lot of people, we see that in nature. I mean, that that's something that's pretty deeply instilled in us, that competition among family members. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were... Um, he always tried to treat me like a, a child, and I always wanted to be the adult. So it was that... Uh, and my father, like I said, we both were mechanics at the time, and we were always, you know... My brother wanted, was running the shop because he was in his early 20s and my father was trying to take it easy and he wanted to pass it on, which he ended up doing. But there was a lot of fighting and um, problematic things that went on between him and I just due to testosterone levels of a mm -hmm. young man and a young teen, you know, sure. in the different times of their life. So it taught me a lot about life, you know, and I was a quiet, pretty quiet kid and reserved until... I'm going to say my 20s, my, or my early 20s, where I started to become a little more used to communicating uh, with, uh, at, by asking for things, you know? A lot of times I wouldn't ask for things, I'd just find a way to, to do it, you know? Wouldn't ask for help or whatever it may be. And that had to do with my upbringing, with my brother and my parents and whatnot, you know? Most of that that we just talked about, pretty, I, really all of that, mm -hmm. 
is our first question. I mean, that, that's our, that's our foundation. And this is one of the things I love about this show is that, you know, we get the opportunity to, to wander around and, and hear your story, the way that you tell your story. I, I absolutely love that. But let's, let's take a turn now. Let's, let's look at something that we haven't talked about yet, which is your, your influences, the folks that, trained you now you mentioned your uncle being that that early influence yeah for exposing you to martial arts and it's pretty clear that he set you on a path whether he knew it or, or not i suspect at that time you didn't know but maybe he knew that this is something that would be a major part of your life if i can say that it, it is because we my uncle is one of 10 so that means we have a lot of cousins my mother's the last of 10 I am the only person that took martial arts and lasted with it with them. So out of all, all the people, I'm the only person that can pass the song of what he is. And he is an influence, but he introduced me to the Pedros, Jimmy Jr. and Jimmy Sr. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, they're the pretty, names are familiar, but I can't place why. Yeah, Jim, Jimmy is a bronze medalist, um, okay. 96, and then 2004. And Jim Sr. was the 76 Olympic alternate, and he trained. And they have probably the highest, and right now they still do, uh, recognition for judo champions. And the Olympics in the U.S. is very weak in judo Mm. because it's not practiced like it is across the world. And they have a very great track record. Um, You know, they had – we had quite a few people come through there, which are are names, which I could mention if you'd like to hear them. But um, Yeah, yeah, I mean – you had uh, Ronda Rousey in there when I was training, and mm. she was a child. And uh, Kayla Harrison, who now is in the MMA, and she's a two-time first gold medalist for U.S., and she's uh, a woman, and she's been through some things if you look her up. And she's a, and they, they really know how to mold people. So my uncle introduced me to them, and I was training with Jimmy in the mid-'90s when he was getting ready for the Olympics. And uh, I was on the team with them where we'd train and I had a bunch of friends and we traveled. And so he put me on a path that he wanted, that he probably couldn't take at that time. So he wanted me to pursue it, you know? Mm. So again, he hooked me up and those, you know, they said Jim Senior is an incredible instructor, whether it be judo or any type of martial art, he has a very great philosophy and he's old fashioned like my uncle. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but um, <laughs> he's he's very old fashioned. So you know where I'm going with that, and I like that. He reminded me a lot of my dad and my uncle, and um, I gravitated towards that because he he was very one worded, and he would give you recognition only when you needed it. You know, he knew he knew people's minds very well. He knew the people that had to be patted on the back, and he knew the people how they were. I didn't need to be patted on the back. I wanted to see results. But he was very good at the psychological warfare of what goes on in an athlete and in and outside of the map. And I like that about him because he would, he would pull you aside and talk to you like a human being and tell you if you were a jerk or an idiot and, or if you were doing well at one point. And I really liked that about him. And I respected my uncle for knowing that I could handle him because a lot of people couldn't. So he made sure I trained that with the best in the world so yeah though they're, they're my major influences my uncle and the pedros as far as judo goes absolutely in in martial arts and they premised a lot on Nawaza. so the groundwork and the grinding style and they you know jimmy could have won either for wrestling or judo in the olympics and his son does also so a very good wrestler and um so i wrestled a lot with them and i took a lot of uh a lot of my training that I teach today to my class comes from all of them. They just have the best style. Um, and as far as, like I said, their, their influence on life itself is incredible. So they're my major influences. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a, a pretty direct question. Do you have yeah, children? I do. Okay. I have two. I have a daughter, Skyla. She's just about 16, and my son, Vittorio, we call him Vito, he's um, going to be 12 soon, and they both do judo on and off. Okay, so yeah, you, you, you knew where I was going with that. Yes. You know, when, when someone has a, a family influence in martial arts, it really seems like 
passing on what they've learned becomes, I, I don't have children of my own and I wasn't taught by my family. So I, 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 I can only observe it, but there just seems to be a different element to the way martial arts is, is imparted when there's a family element there. And that, that seems to make sense to me because when we, excuse me, when we look back, that's how martial arts was passed down in so many areas is it was a familial obligation to make sure that the next generation could defend themselves. Absolutely. So I'm curious, how did your upbringing in martial arts, you know, starting at such a young age, how did that have an influence on the way you shared with and saw your responsibility in teaching your children? My daughter is an incredible person. And I'm not saying that because she's my daughter. <laughs> um, my son is a character, but we'll get back to him. But my daughter is very athletic. Um, her mother, my wife, who is genetically gifted, my daughter took the best of both of us. She has a, even at a young age, I remember her at three, she just can think on her own. And she can make great decisions without thought. And that's something that a lot of people can't do. So I saw this in her young. And um, we, we have dogs. We uh, American Pit Bull Terriers. And I remember my daughter, we had a dog named Luna. And... She was trying to train her at three years old. And this is a dog that was probably 12 at the time, you know, on, on death's door, let's say. Yeah. And it was, you know, like I said, we, we, um, we showed this dog. We, we did a lot. And she saw a lot of what we did at a young age. And we'd run her on the treadmill. I remember my daughter putting her on the treadmill at 12 years old. And we had other dogs that were younger. <laughs> she tried hooking her up. And um, was telling her to run the treadmill. So I'm watching her do this, like I said, three, maybe almost four. And uh, she had a, a will about her that um, made me think, well, let me start putting her in martial arts. Usually I would say five or six for a child. So I put her in very early. I remember bringing her at like, you know, right after I saw that, I brought her. And um, she took to it pretty well. So as... I learned from my own mistakes. I said, I'll let her do it for a couple of months and take her away from it and ha let her have a childhood, you know? Because I see a lot of parents put them in and the kids hate it and they're forced to do it. I'm sure, we've all seen that. Mm -hmm. So I gave her the choice and she chose to come. So every time, you know, she kept asking to come and then she wanted to compete at a very young age and she started competing. And then, you know, she's in high school now, but through her elementary school years she was in and out um but mainly staying into it because we let her do other sports and that she excels at she's very good at basketball and softball and our basketball career is taking off and um a lot of it has to do with the athleticism we've trained into her and her own will but um she's competed and she's the path she's taking in her mindset for you know she preps her own meals and like I said, she saw my wife and I doing it, but she, she just took control of it. And that's the type of person she is. So um, as far as the influence of martial arts in her life is very heavy, but she's also, I want her to be a teen also. I missed out on a lot of things that I don't want her to do. And trying to get that balance is very hard. And, she, and she's very talented and she's almost a brown belt now. She should be a brown belt, but I, um, she's right there. But um, she took some time off of basketball, and she comes back and forth, and she trains with Pedro's and myself. So she knows competition well, and she's very regimented. And my son's taken a lighter form, whereas he likes it. He wants to learn it. He's still young. When we all know boys mature a lot slower than females when it comes to decision-making. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's naturally gifted, and my daughter's a hard worker and athletic. So she's a workhorse and my son, he's more, if I show him something, he learns it quick, but if something gives him adversity, you have to make him do it. So again, they're two individuals. They're both talented, but my, my daughter's a little older and again, mature, really mature for her age. And the influence of martial arts in her life has taken her to a lot of places. She's an incredible artist and, um, She's, she's very um, inspiring. 
as a, as a child, you know, it's incredible. Now, when you look at where your children are in terms of martial arts, mm -hmm. hopefully I, I would assume that everyone, you know, we're all trying to do our, do our best. We're all doing what, what seems to be right. How do you think your martial arts upbringing would have gone if you had been raising you? That's a great question. If I was raising myself, I would have forced myself to do everything. I wouldn't have gave myself a choice. Why? Um, knowing who I am. Hmm. Um, I'm the type of person that I've learned through the years that I have a lot of interests. And I made this mistake training myself where I was doing too much at once. I was uh, training dogs for dog shows. I was, I was uh, an elite athlete in judo. And I was, uh, you know, I had some car restoration stuff where I was doing. And I, you know, I drag race. So I was trying to do all these three things at once. I just got married. I just had a child. So I didn't focus on one thing. And youth is wasted on the young. I'm sure you've heard that. And I was, I was working real hard. I'd wake up at four every morning. And I was regimented, and I tried to fit too much into one day. If I had just the discipline to focus on one thing, I would have picked. We are only our athletic bodies only last so long, so it's like fruit; we expire. So if you you don't catch it when it's ripe, you could lose that chance that a lot of people lose. So if it was me training me, I would have forced, said to myself, "This is what you're doing. This is how you have to do it." Forget about this other stuff. It's going to be there later. If that was me training me. But as far as my daughter goes, I take a different approach. Sure. Sure. And everyone's different. And of course, that's, that's such an important thing to understand. And that's one of the challenges of being an instructor in a mixed group, in a, in a bigger class. You get people that are there for different reasons, different motivations, who learn differently. And they all need something a little bit different. And a good instructor, in my opinion, I'm curious if you agree, mm -hmm. will find that individuality, that individual motivation, and teach to that person as much as they can and, and repeat across everyone in the class rather than just kind of pick an average and teach in that way. You know, I have a good story for that. Oh, please. How, how I learned this, and it's between two people. Um, my uncle had a student that is one of my assistant instructors. His name is Sir Patrick Ken, and he's my assistant instructor. And I, I teach at a uh, Carlson Gracie School, Broadway Jiu Jitsu, named um, Broadway Jiu Jitsu, and John Clark. Um, we've been teaching there about six years together. But um, John is a very intelligent individual, and so was in Sir Petra. Um, we call him Master Ken, no pun intended, because <laughs> his last name is Ken. But um, he picks up on something. I'm very one, you know, I'm like a horse with a blinder sometimes. And I only had one way to train people, and that's the way I was taught. And I understood that the psychology of a human being changes as years pass or as they get older or as they're younger. But I, you know, I had one way of training people. The strong survive and the weak die. And that's a bad way to train people. Because martial arts is for everybody. Competition may not be for everybody, but martial arts is for everybody. And these two individuals showed me that. And the way they showed me that was uh, Professor John Clark, who has done many martial arts. And if you look him up, he's very well renowned. He's one of the best grapplers I've seen. And his teaching style is incredible. And so was uh, Master Ken, I'll call him, uh, Sapetra. He, um, they both have the same outlook on martial arts. And John has this class called the, the Beginner's Class. And it's for grappling. And it, it was kind of in the same time zone as mine. And Sapetra picked up on this. And what it is, it's a place where people can go to learn the basics of grappling and defense. And we, we all had beginners classes in karate, judo, jiu-jitsu, whatever it is. And the beginning is very boring, correct? Have you experienced yeah. that? 
where you're learning more. Everybody wants to hit and punch, and everybody wants to throw and choke or arm lock, but that doesn't happen right away, does it? No. Not usually. <laughs> so, you know, I remember learning a lot of defensive skill and striking arts and head movement and lower body movement, which was very boring, but it's the core of what you use every day for when you become really proficient at it. And in judo, you learn how to fall, which is the most boring thing in the world. Slapping the mat. And it's very important because if you take a fall the wrong way, you could break your neck and die. So that being understood, when I grew up, it was very boring. So what, they, what John had developed was a beginner's class where people are learning. And you can stay in that class forever because this is going on five years, six years. I've seen him or organize this class, and these people still take it. If they were under my clock, they would have quit. And I firmly believe that on my old thought process. They would have came in and said, wow, this is tough. I can't handle this. My body's taking a beating. Or they survive and they make it through. So Sapetra, who's my assistant instructor, said, did you watch this class that John has? He goes, it's incredible. So we'd stay and we'd watch it. And what he developed was he developed a system of where they're learning the drills. And like I said, I could sit here and talk hours on it, but I'll keep it brief. And he shows things, and this is how I teach now, where it's entry, execution, and finish. So when you come in, he shows you how to enter the technique. He shows you how to execute the technique, and he shows you the finish. And we've all been instructed where, no, you're doing this wrong. No, you're doing that wrong. It's very, some people can't take well to that. And the way he speaks to people, he makes you just feel comfortable and he makes you understand where your problem points are and he makes you understand where you're doing correct. So the way he teaches is incredible. And I adopted this style through watching him and, um, Petra, my assistant instructor, has always done that indirectly, but he picked up on it where we can improve. And it's, it's amazing that um, he keeps these students that I would, <laughs> like I said, I have a competitive mind, and I would say this guy isn't a competitor, this girl isn't a competitor, and, or whoever it is, this woman, child, whoever. And now I've changed my philosophy due to how they instruct. So he's kept a great client base and as an instructor of giving these people a place where they can learn martial arts. You don't have to be a competitor. But you know something? I watched some of these people who I never thought could excel in martial arts end up becoming competitors. And it's all a different mindset. So I gotta got to say that's pretty impressive and something I've learned from him and them. It really sounds like you've been blessed with some amazing instructors. And, and I think all too often when people make lists of who they've trained with, we, we, we tend to want to look for the folks who have name recognition, who have, mm. you know, these important lineages, the fewest step between you and and somebody who started a style or someone important you know we, we like to think that that's what makes a great instructor but but it's not and i think the stories that you're telling here today so perfectly illustrate that that the best instructors are the people who are best able to reach the students and get the best out of them uh absolutely um the, the psychological connection between training and keeping somebody interested or immense Mm -hmm. And if you don't connect with each individual personally and get to know them a bit, I'm not saying you have to be, you know, hang out with them every day or whatever, because we can't do that physically as instructors. But as an instructor, you have to have a personal level of communication with, we call, I call it touch time. If I go to a class and the instructor is instructing the class as a general, that's great. But you got to go around and have touch time with each student individually. And you got to pick up on where their good points are and they need instruction on where their bad points are. Mm. So what, what I've noticed is, like you said, you, you got to have that connection with each person. Not, not generalized. Like I said, we've all been to generalized camps or whatever where they're showing techniques. But my body type is different than your body type. So 
and what these instructors and my instructors and other instructors that I gravitate towards do well is make it work for you. And that's what we need to do as martial arts instructors is understand that not every technique is for every student and everybody has a fight style. And you gotta bring that out of that person. And we gotta analyze what it is their body type is, how to get into their minds, see what their fears are, if, if any, or, or uh, and see what their, why they, why are you there? What, why, what brought you to martial arts? So everybody, I think if you don't have that connection, your students won't respect you. And if you have that connection, they're gonna find that it's better to have a human being teach you than a robot. Mm. Couldn't agree more. And we've spent the, the day, our time today, talking about the past, talking about everything that's brought you up to where you are now. So let's turn our eyes to the future. What, what are you inspired about when it comes to martial arts? What's keeping you motivated? You know, do, do you have goals that you're still working towards? Tell us what the next, however many years, however you want to define it, have in store for you as a martial artist. Um, it's a good question. I try to live in the moment now where, I, where, you know, a lot of people plan in the future and think of the past. So I try to live in the moment, but thinking of the future, I know I'm going to be in instructing till the day I die, I would hope. And it seems that way. So what's in the future is I'd like to reach out to more people and keep interested in what I have to share with them. Um, again, there's a, there's a miscommunication between um, student and teacher at times, and I like to lessen that. So I would like to make the community a lot better and a lot larger by keeping people in and interested in what I have to teach along with my instructors. Mm -hmm. So if I had a future that I would like to, to gain more students and have them pass on what I know, because as, as an instructor, you can be a great competitor, but you're not, that doesn't mean you're a great instructor. And we've all seen that. So I, as far as teaching goes, what good is my knowledge or anybody else's if, I'm, if I die with them? I want to pass on that knowledge to each and every one that I have. And I would hope that they could tr branch off like trees and teach what I've known through my experiences. So if I'm one, I want to touch a million people that can pass on what I've taught them. So that's my, my goal if I had to pick one. That's great. I, I, I can, I can see a lot of my, a lot of my goals, a lot of my attitudes in, in what you're talking about. So yeah, without a doubt. Now, what if people want to get a hold of you? Is there, is there anywhere online they can find you? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't use social media much. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, the only one I use is really LinkedIn, the business site. And I, I post my, per, I don't post many personal things. I post some, some martial arts stuff and some of my automotive stuff. But um, I'm there on LinkedIn under my name, Victor D. Simone. Um, I'm still trying to figure Twitter out, but I'm on that under my name, Victor D. Simone. Okay. And, um, but again, I, I don't understand that site that well. I, I know what it's for, but I, I'm really not on it. But I am there. Um, and I'm in at uh, Broadway Jiu Jitsu okay. in uh, South Boston, Carlson Gracie School. So right. that's where I am. All right. And, you know, folks, we'll definitely link to the LinkedIn page. Uh, if you're new to the show, you may not know, we do show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we drop photos and, and all kinds of stuff like that. You can check out. Well, this, this has been great. This has been a lot of fun. You definitely have a different background than, than a lot of us. I mean, um, your stories mm -hmm. definitely gave me some stuff to chew on, <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and I appreciate that. So thank you for that. But I'd love to ask for one more favor if I could. And that's what parting advice would you give to the folks listening today? The best advice I could give is you need to focus on what's good for you. Um, whether it be martial arts, whether it be work, whether it be family, whether it be a struggle, you got to understand that you're stronger than you believe. 
And a lot of people sell themselves short. If you have a dream, you can follow it or you can let it die. So you, all your decisions you make are ultimately your own. So if even if you fail at them, you got to go through with what's in your mind of what you think you can accomplish because you can do a lot more than you can believe. So I'm going to tell everybody out there that if you can dream it, you can do it. And that's a big, uh, a big thing people don't do. So fail at it, succeed at it. If you don't try, you're not going to succeed. So that's all I can tell you out there. We've had plenty of people on the show who have taught family or learned from family. But I don't know that we've had too many people who have had both. They've taught family, they've learned from family, and been so aware of how both aspects, both, both transfers of information so deeply affected them. I think the part that struck me the most was when Sensei Di Simone was talking about his children and the differences between them and how clearly he loved both of them and supported them in their growth, in their differences. And while maybe that's a little bit easier when it's your child, that is absolutely what I think all of us who are passing on martial arts in even a small way should be aspiring to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time on the show today. If you want to check out the show notes, we've got some photos, we've got a transcript, we've got a lot of stuff, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you want to support us, check out everything we've got going at whistlekick.com, all of our products, and you can save 15% using the code PODCAST15. We've also got a wholesale program, so if you're a school owner and you haven't signed up yet, do it. It's free. Discounts. Good stuff. <laughs> if you want to follow us on social media, you should do so. We are at Whistlekick. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And my email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? Yeah.